Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Insights, Newcastle University's public lectures program. Um, it's always a delight to welcome you to our events, but particularly as it's only the second event in person for two and a half years. We had our first last week. Um, it's wonderful to see you here. Thank you for coming. Um, as you're here for this lecture, you may be interested to know of our final two lectures in this program, which are on Tuesday the 17th and Thursday the 19th of May. We have Justin Greening uh, here speaking on levelling up national mission and global challenge, the former Minister for Women and Equalities. And on the Thursday of that week, the 19th, we have Dr. Catherine Haddon from the Institute of Government marking the Platinum Jubilee speaking on the monarchy and the UK's evolving constitution. Uh, chairing today's lecture, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Neil Carmichael, whom you may remember from last semester's programme where he spoke on the Conservative Party after Brexit. He is a former Conservative MP, and he now uh, acts as chair of the UK-China Educational Com Corporation, which uh, oversees early years education in China. Neil. Well, thank you very much, Martin, um, and thank you all for coming uh, to this lecture. Um, first of all, I just want to say that uh, I stood as a parliamentary candidate for the first time round when Chris was uh, chairman of the party, which we were both then um, proud members of. Uh, things have changed. Um, uh, but um, uh, those, of you, those of you who know uh, me as well as Chris will uh, be aware of our uh, belief in the European Union um, and, um, let's say, a more thoughtful uh, style of politics. Um, the Edward Heath uh, Foundation, the Sir Edward Heath uh, Charitable Foundation, uh, has set up these lectures to make sure that we can actually reach out to young people about the issues that happened during the 70s, which are still relevant now. Uh, our first lecture was about uh, Europe, and uh, the focus was on Brexit, and that was Lord Michael Heseltine giving a full uh, blast against Brexit, um, uh, as you can uh, well imagine. Uh, today, we've got um, uh, uh, Lord Chris Patton, who's going to be talking about the international order that was created really during the time that Edward Heath dominated political uh, politics. Um, and uh, it's changing now. Uh, there are threats to it, uh, as we can see uh, in, in Ukraine, but also elsewhere. Uh, next, we'll be talking about the, uh, the structure of Britain uh, with Malcolm Rifkin at the University of Edinburgh on the 27th of September. And we'll be doing these sort of uh, lectures for basically another three years uh, because uh, Ted Heath was Prime Minister for four years and we were marking each year with a series uh, of lectures. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and just, just to be uh, uh, clear about one other thing, we have an excellent house, Ted Heath's uh, home uh, in Salisbury, Arundel's, which you're all welcome to visit at any time and frequently. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Chris Patton. Uh, he was, as I've already mentioned, chairman of the Conservative Party. Before that, Ted Heath had made him chair chairman uh, of the Conser uh, Conservative Research Department, an excellent uh, start to a very fine, stellar career. But Chris also served as Secretary of State for the Environment. Um, he uh, famously was governor uh, of Hong Kong and has never stopped demonstrating a sharp awareness of the issues at hand in British politics and a willingness to talk about them, which he will do today. So thank you all very much and welcome, Chris. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind um, obituary notice. And, um, <laughs> It, it is salutary, I have to say, when you realise that your, um, what passes for your career is now regarded as history, slightly later than the Middle Ages, but uh, not much. But I am very pleased to be um, back in Newcastle. Um, um, I've, I've just, I'm about to, this is a bit of sales pitch, I'm, I'm about to publish my Hong Kong diaries, and I noticed looking through them the other day um, that I visited the new university for the first time in 1993 um, when my eldest daughter um, had just um, come to study here. And it says a great deal for the university that still, I think it's true to say, um, a, a large uh, majority of her friends are friends that she made at Newcastle University. She was very happy here and I enjoyed coming back to see her and then I enjoyed being um, chancellor here for a, a number of years. I took over from, um, from one of uh, the most important local TOFs, 
um, who gave me some very good advice about congregations um, and uh, giving out degrees. He said he sh he'd always been very careful uh, what he said to people when he was shaking their hand and giving them a degree because on one occasion um, he'd been uh, congratulating somebody who'd just got a, a Bachelor of Arts uh, and said to her, so um, what, what, are you, what are you gonna do next? And she said to him, I, I've got no plans, what do you have in mind? <laughs> so I, 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 never, I never made that error. Um, I'm, uh, I've got a birthday next week. Um, presents gratefully received. Um, I was born in 1944. The day I was born, the 12th of May 1944, um, the German army was driven out of the Crimea by, the, uh, by Russian forces, including, of course, Ukrainians. My best friend at school, who was called Sikorsky, um, was born the following week. In the same week, that his father was killed in the Battle of Monte Cassino. Uh, two months later, um, three months later, my wife's father was killed in Normandy um, <coughs> about a month before she was born. That was the end of what some people called the Second Thirty Years' War, 1914-18, when 40 million people died, 1939-45, when 80 million died, half of them in Russia and China. Auden is my favorite poet of the period. In the nightmares of the dark, all the dogs of Europe bark, and the waiting nations, and the living nations wait, each sequestered in its hate. And that was then. And what's remarkable, and remarkably lucky, is to have been born, you could have said the same thing after the Congress of Vienna in the 19th century, to have been born in the lucky half of the 20th century to have been born um, at a time when, by and large, with some exceptions and important ones like Vietnam and parts of Africa, people lived relatively peaceful lives with growing prosperity. And that was partly because of the generation of which Ted Heath was such a prominent member. Ted Heath had been a fierce opponent of appeasement in the 1930s. He had fought in the Second World War. He was then part of the generation which helped to create the Atlantic institutions and the European institutions and the global institutions which gave the world a much better second half of the 20th century than it had had in the first half. And in particular, he was, of course, the main political agent, as well as Harold Macmillan, who argued for Britain to have uh, a place in the European Union, something which we've now, in an astonishing act of self-harm, thrown over. What's very interesting is that the world created after 1945 was largely a result of that very rare thing. The victor in particular, the victors in some, in some senses in a war, actually creating institutions which they allowed to determine their own behavior much of the time and not just wanted to impose on everyone else. And nobody should underestimate the role that 
Roosevelt that Harry Truman played with the creation of the UN, the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, the creation of uh, NATO. Na NATO wasn't Im imposed by America on Europe. It was Europe that wanted America to stay behind um, because of their people were frightened of Russia. What was the objective of NATO? Its first Secretary General said, to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. And the price which America insisted on us paying for that was to prevent, once again, as had happened in the 1920s, another outbreak of protectionist, nationalist aggression. So um, it was America that pushed us hard to, into the uh, coal and steel community, which eventually became the common market, which eventually became the European Union. So the, so the view we normally have that NATO was, in, was uh, imposed on us and the European Union was, was our own idea is pretty well the opposite of what actually happened. That world gave us the prosperity um, and the peace that, I've, uh, that I mentioned earlier. But I suppose the two biggest stories of my lifetime took place in the 70s and 80s and began, in a sense, the disruption of that world in ways which, to some extent, we thought were probably in our interests. First of all, we saw the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I once heard uh, Mr. Putin about whom a bit more later. I once heard Mr. Putin say that the uh, fall of the Soviet Union was, in his view, the most important and tragic event of the 20th century. Soviet Union collapsing and China rising, or actually rising again, because the extraordinary story of China was in the 19th century when it went downhill rather than in the 20th century when it's come up again. In, uh, 19, in 1820, China represented 30% of the world's economy, and thanks to the depredations of imperial power, imperial powers, thanks to the uh, weaknesses of the Qing dynasty, uh, thanks to uh, civil war in China, thanks to the policies of Mao communism, thanks to all those things, that 30% by the 1970s had become 3%. So those two great stories the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of China, which in an extraordinary way today have become joined, at least in their consequences, as I'll try to explain in a moment. The collapse of the Soviet Union took place at an extraordinary rate, and I guess was partly a consequence of the uh, economic weakness of Russia, except that it had oil and gas and nuclear weapons, partly a result uh, of uh, the existential uh, challenges to any authoritarian, totalitarian state, partly a result of its um, overextension in Afghanistan. And looking back, it is extraordinary how quickly it all happened. A great friend of mine was um, the Europe minister in the Mrs. Thatcher's government, not an easy job to do in Mrs. Thatcher's government. And he was um, visiting Berlin in 1989 as part of um, his ministerial duties. And William Walgrave, the first day he was there, was outraged because a, because a German student was shot, not climbing over the wall in Berlin, but trying to swim out of East Berlin into the west across the canal. And William said to his officials and to the West German officials who were with him, we must make a real fuss about this. We must, uh, 
show how angry we are and it might stop them doing it again. And his officials and the West German officials and the West Berlin officials said, mm, wouldn't do that, Minister, if I were you. Um, we have better ways of, of dealing with them. You know, it, we have to be a bit more sophisticated than that. You know, we have to go on having a relationship with them. But, you know, we'll make clear that we'd, as William said, within two weeks, no East Berlin, no wall, no East Germany, all swept into the trash can of history and the Soviet Union with it. And the best book, I think, about what then happened is a book by the former bureau chief of the Financial Times in Moscow, Catherine Belton, called Putin's People, a book which several of our most distinguished QCs became even richer trying to prevent being published because it's very rude about oligarchs. What actually happened with the wreck of the Soviet Union was that it was taken over by the KGB and by a corrupt cl class of, uh, uh, of business men um, who <coughs> funded Yeltsin's attempts to stay in power by getting money on the cheap from the Russian banks uh, and buying up um, Russian assets. And Putin was at the middle of this whole enterprise. And it's interesting that today it's still the case that his uh, main uh, advisors, uh, his uh, colleagues from the KGB and particularly the KGB in St. Petersburg at, at that time. I, I dealt with Putin quite a lot when I was a European External Affairs Commissioner from 1999 to 2004. It's not something I'm particularly proud of. But the first time I met Mr. Putin um, was at a, an EU-Russia summit in 1999 when the Finns were in the European Union presidency. And we had a meeting in Helsinki with the Finnish president and foreign minister, president of the European Commission, and me. And uh, waiting that morning for the beginning of the meeting, we suddenly got a message that Mr. Yeltsin, who was still the president, was unfortunately ill and not able to be with us. Ill? Spectacularly hungover. So he was sending the then acting prime minister, Mr. Putin, who none of us knew. And while we were waiting for him to come, the tapes, that's what, what we called in those days, were, were giving the news that Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, had uh, unfortunately had two terrible explosions with a lot of <coughs> loss of life that morning. We didn't know why. And when Putin arrived for the meeting and we were making smallish talk with him, we said to him, we've been reading about these, these explosions in, in Grozny. Can you tell us anything about them? He said, oh, he hadn't heard of them. He said, uh, uh, but, you know, if you ask me at lunchtime, I'll find out by then. So we did ask him again about the explosions at lunchtime. And he said, oh, it's what I think you call an own goal. He said there were Chechen guerrillas uh, running arms bazaars and there were a lot of weapons and weaponry exploded. Well, by that stage, the tape, the AFP, Reuters and so on, were all reporting that Russian helicopter gunships had attacked Grozny. And the point about Mr. Putin is not just that he lied to us, but he knew that we knew he was lying to us. And that's been an aspect of his behavior ever since I had to deal with him on access to Kaliningrad, when his first proposal was that we should agree to a sealed train between 
Russia and the oblast of Kaliningrad. And I said, um, well, I said, uh, seal trains have a certain history in Europe, and I'm not sure that that would go down too well. I dealt with him about the, um, the extension of the existing trade deals between, uh, between the European Union and Russia to the new member states. So I got to see him quite a bit, and I haven't been surprised to discover that he is a cold-blooded murderer. The problem, of course, with the efficacy of dictators is they live and operate in an echo chamber. They never hear anything which those who are speaking to them don't think they want to hear. It's not as though we haven't had lots of warnings about Mr. Putin. We had, um, for example, we had the uh, cyber attacks on Estonia in, two, in 2007, even after the Grozny and Chechen war. Uh, we had, of course, um, the uh, war, the invasion of Georgia in 2008 with the uh, annexation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. We had had in 2014 uh, the invasion of Crimea. We had throughout that period all the deaths in eastern Ukraine, including, of course, the Malaysian airline, airliner, which was uh, shot down. And we had the behavior of Russian forces in Syria under some of the same generals, some of those who were still alive, who have been in the Ukraine with, for example, the smashing to bits of Aleppo. So it's not as though we didn't know what Putin was like. Um, the problem is, what happens next? We've uh, looked the other way while he's clearly been behind the killing of people he doesn't like in other countries, including our own. You think Putin doesn't know about people who were sent to Salisbury, doesn't know about um, the attempt to put Novichok in the underpants of people he, uh, uh, who he thought uh, might oppose him. Of course he knows about all those things. But it is going to be very, very difficult when, as I hope will happen, uh, this um, war concludes with some sort of Russian withdrawal. It's going to be very difficult to know how we could do business with Mr. Putin again if he's still in office. Uh, now there are reports, not least in today's papers, um, in other countries, uh, about um, some of his FSB uh, and generals, um, his, his FSB colleagues and generals, uh, starting to plot against him. There are reports about his ill health, and without sounding too cold-blooded, uh, it would be a help um, if uh, uh, the Russian military or the almighty were to remove him. I hope uh, that we don't see um, any more of his uh, uh, threats about the use of nuclear weapons. We have no idea what they mean. Pe people who talk about tactical nuclear weapons and what you could do about them, the people who talk about them um, are generally those who don't know anything at all about them, and the people who know about them don't talk about them um, because the, uh, the story is, is so alarming. So here we have Russia, a weak economy, which has the energy, the gas, and the oil that we've been buying in huge quantities, hoping, trying with this, dictator with this dictatorship to recreate the Soviet Union, um, with, as in, every, in every other way, with nothing to contribute to the international community. It can terrify us, but not in ways which, if we're steadfast, we should be too bothered by. Because uh, if you were doing marking Mr. Putin's card at the moment, you'd see economy in ruins, ruble in the dust, 
half his foreign exchange earnings um, confiscated. Uh, you'd see uh, far from uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians turning out to offer bunches of flowers, uh, Ukrainians fighting an, in an extraordinary campaign against him. You'd see NATO not fragmented, but more together today than it's been um, for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, you'd see his own army, his own soldiers, humiliated as far as the international media is concerned by their incompetence. Except when it comes to committing war crimes, where they seem to be very productive. So you can't think, look at all that and reckon that it's been a terrific success story for Mr. Putin. So I think that um, provided we uh, don't see any huge change in his fortunes, which I'm not expecting, I think we're dealing with post-peak Putin. And what of China? the other great neo-totalitarian state in the world. I mentioned that um, uh, the Chinese um, economy had been in a very different condition to that of Russia. But that hasn't always been the case since the Chinese Communist Party took over. Um, for years, they suffered from Mao Stone Age economics. Jung Chang, the biographer of, of uh, Mao and the author of that wonderful book about her own family, I once asked her how she would mark Mao in comparison with um, Pol Pot, <coughs> Stalin, Hitler, where he would be placed in her uh, league table of monsters. I said one to 10, and she said 10 plus. Probably responsible if you uh, look at, for example, the work done by a, a Polish, I mean, a, a Dutch historian called de Cotter, probably responsible for at least 45 million deaths. Hong Kong, is in part his creation. Two thirds at least of the population of Hong Kong are refugees from communist China, from the Great Leap Forward, from the Great Famine, from the Cultural Revolution, who escaped from communism, scrambling over, over razor wire, swimming through the through sea, dangerous seas, in the case of Jimmy Lai, stowing away at age 12, all getting away from Chinese communism to find a safe haven in a British colony. Can you imagine the humiliation for a Chinese communist apparatchik who would argue that in order to show you love China, you had to love the Communist Party. It's a sort of Leninist theological equivalent of consubstantiality. But if you and your family have escaped China because of the awful things done by the communists, you're unlikely um, to find that an easy match. So Mao died in 1976, and fortunately was followed by Deng Xiaoping, who came out of the um, semi-incarceration uh, which he'd suffered during the Cultural Revolution from time to time. And you then saw that extraordinary rise in the Chinese economy once it was opened up to the rest of the world. From 1979 to 2018, the Chinese economy grew at a rate of about 9.5% a year. Uh, during that period, the Chinese economy doubled in size 
every eight years. China became the world's greatest exporter, partly because we were dismantling our trade barriers. Chinese exports to the United States in the 19, from, the 18, from the 1980s to the 1990s went up by 1,600% in 15 years. China became a hugely important hub in the international supply chain. It became the largest energy consumer in the world. And it became a very important market for some Western manufacturers. General Motors, for example, or Siemens. And it also managed to move from lower technologies into higher ones, sometimes because um, of uh, Chinese hard work and genius, and sometimes with a little help from intellectual property theft and bullying of Western companies. The success of China in those, uh, particularly in those years in the 1990s and early 2000s, led, I think, to a number of um, mistakes or delusions by the West, by America, Britain, Europe. First of all, we convinced ourselves that if a country opened up ec economically and developed economically and developed technologically, sooner or later, it would change politically. That there was a sort of umbilical relationship um, that uh, if you became more powerful economically, then you were bound to change politically. That you were bound to change politically in order to escape what's called the middle income trap for a country. And we said some pretty daft things about that. Thomas Friedman said that uh, followed the the golden arches principle that one country which had McDonald's would never fight another that had McDonald's. Well, that went for a you know. Um, with the Dell trap, or the, the Dell proposition, that no country which shared a supply chain with others would ever go to war with it. Tony Blair said after the Chinese had um, become members of the WTO, um, in 2000, and they became members in 2003. When in 2005, uh, Tony Blair said that as a result of them joining the WTO, China's progress to becoming a democracy was now unstoppable. Secondly, we kidded ourselves that the Chinese were becoming, or would become, more democratic, but also more like us in lots of other ways. Um, there's a, there was a wonderful letter written by the, famous letter written by the American diplomat George Kennan in 1946 um, about how to deal with the Soviet Union. And he said in that letter, we have to realize talking about Russia, that their idea of reality and ours are incompatible. It's exactly the same with the Chinese Communist Party, not necessarily the Chinese, but with the Chinese Communist Party today. And if you don't believe that, it's worth remembering that the instructions that the present president party secretary, sorry, in China, Xi Jinping first gave, called Communique Number no. 9, an Orwellian title, told the party and the government officials that they had to engage in an intense struggle to prevent any aspects 
of Western liberalism corrupting China, rule of law, freedom of speech, the other freedoms that we associate with an open economy. I think what's happening in Xinjiang and what we think is appropriate governance, the incompatible. I think forced sterilization or forced abortions incompatible. I think the trade in body parts is incompatible. I think the way that Tibet has been handled incompatible with what we think should happen. I think that what's happened in Hong Kong is more than incompatible because that raises another thing which I think we've got badly wrong. My main critic when I was governor of Hong Kong was a very clever British diplomat called Sir Percy Craddock, who once said to me and others, he actually wrote this later on, and he talked about, uh, he'd been talking about his uh, experience of China during the Cultural Revolution. And he said to us, of, he said to us, of course it's true that the Chinese leaders are thuggish dictators. But, he said, they're men of their word. Really? Men of their word breaking that word with how they've behaved in the South China Sea. Men of their word in how they've treated Hong Kong, breaking the joint declaration, an international treaty lodged at the UN. Breaking their word um, slipping round that word uh, in the WTO or the WHO. Coronavirus. Well, there are still debates about its origins. What we know, though, is that SARS in 2002, 2003 certainly came from China. And one of the results um, uh, was that afterwards the WHO um, got everybody, eventually including China, to agree to what were called the international health regulations, one of which obliged the countries who signed it to report in a, in a timely fashion, preferably within 24 hours, uh, any outbreak of an epid any outbreak of a public health problem in their country. So at the uh, end of January 20, I could forget the years, 2020, with uh, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister in Australia, with reports from Taiwan of this extraordinary outbreak of something in Wuhan, Wang Yi told the Australian foreign minister that um, yes, there was a problem, but this, uh, this illness was preventable and curable and couldn't be transmitted from one person to another. At the same time, as the Australians subsequently discovered, the Chinese were buying PPE equipment hand over fist from Australia and from the United Kingdom and elsewhere. So not surprisingly, the Australians asked for a proper investigation into what happened, at which point, since they're making difficulties for the Chinese narrative, um, they're put on the naughty step, and there are economic campaigns against them by the Chinese government. It's the same thing has happened with Japan, with Norway, with Philippines, with others. So those, I think, have all been mistakes, not attempts to build a wall around China, but real um, mistakes which have led to us behaving more foolishly in relation to China and perhaps have encouraged them to behave from time to time less well.
Um, I think under Jiang Zemin and under Hu Jintao, things in China, certainly in relation to Hong Kong, which is what I follow more closely than anything else, but more generally, things hadn't been going too badly. Things were opening up a bit. Civil society and so on was opening up. It wasn't becoming a great parliamentary democracy, but it was certainly a, a society more at ease with itself. <coughs> but there was an economic problem, which Wen Jiaobo, the prime minister under Hu Jintao, identified very clearly in a famous speech which he described as the four uns. He said that the Chinese economy was unbalanced between maritime provinces and internally, unstable because of growing social inequity, uncoordinated because, for example, uh, property and housing takes 29% of China's GDP, and unsustainable because of the amount of, of uh, resources required from other countries in order to keep it going and because of the amount of, of uh, carbon required to keep it going. Hu Jintao was nevertheless thought by some of the other leaders to have allowed things to drift in China. And Xi Jinping came in as the person who was going to stop that drift. I think he was partly there because of some nervousness. I think the leadership was spooked by what had looked like an attempt by another Chinese leader called Bo Xilai, supported by the security boss who also ran the energy industries, Zhou Yang Kang, to actually push their way into the leadership. But they were also, I think, becoming nervous about changes in the internet, which made it more difficult to run a surveillance state. I think they were becoming worried about some consequences of globalization. And I think they were also worried about urbanization, which had produced a large 300 million pool of migrant workers wanting to work in cities where they couldn't get um, the documentation which would allow them uh, to get uh, the education and health benefits which they wanted. So Xi Jinping's reaction with his colleagues was to try to, try to tighten the screws everywhere. Civil society, um, across the board, in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong, uh, and of course, in dealing with the economy. And what you've seen quite interestingly in the last few years is not just a return of, of the personality cult which you saw under Mao, not only an attempt by Xi Jinping um, to become, as it were, boss for life. <laughs> Attitudes to, to Mao, which are surprising given the way that Mao had treated Xi Jinping's father, who was one of the reformers who was brought back under Deng Xiaoping. But nevertheless, um, uh, Xi Jinping has taken a Maoist um, approach, and not least to the economy. The main growth in the economy, tax revenues, innovation, employment, as the principal economic advisor to Xi Jinping, Liu He, said recently, comes from the private sector. But the private sector only gets about 10, 11% of official bank loans, 80% of which go to the state-owned enterprises. And Xi Jinping has been favoring the state-owned enterprises at the expense of the private sector, which is bound, I think, to have substantial economic consequences at the same time that Xi has to deal with the real big underlying problems facing China. One, excessive debt, with debt representing about 300% of China's GDP. Second, demography, with an aging population, um, 300 million um, uh, uh, retired, or in increase in the number of retired of 300 million um, by 2030, um, and 
a gender imbalance, which gets worse and worse as you go down the age groups. So from the 10 to 20 year olds, there's, an, it, there's a gender imbalance of about 16 or 17 percent. More boys than girls. Just think what the consequences of that are in the longer term. She's um, ambitions at the moment don't go much further than being elected to another term, ending the corporate leadership, ending the idea of two-term leaders. Uh, at the party congress in 2020, he wants to get another five years at the top, and I guess after that, another five years. And in order to do that, he would like to have a period of stability. There's something we all call the Chinese curse. Um, actually, it was a statement originally made by a British ambassador um, in 1934 in China. The Chinese curse, as you know, is may you live in interesting times. Well, that's the last thing Xi Jinping wants because he wants stability um, until 2020 so he, so he can get the top job um, without too much um, difficulty. But the times are very interesting. You've not only got economic problems, rising unemployment, slowing growth, but he's got, first of all, coronavirus and the pursuit of his own policy to try to shut cities down, drive down rates of coronavirus um, with the most draconian and ineffective measures imaginable. If you want to um, see some of the consequences, put into YouTube reaction of the population of Shanghai to the lockdown. An extraordinary piece of film. Um, I'm, I'm told that one piece of film is even more extra extraordinary because the one I've seen has uh, the noise made by people in, in high level blocks in an estate at night. There's another one which has people jumping out of windows. So, his policy on COVID um, is creating economic problems, shutting down cities, and political problems. And secondly, he didn't count on Mr. Putin being a liar. There's no question that Mr. Putin and Xi Jinping discussed when they met at the end of the Winter Olympics in Beijing, there's no, there's no doubt that Mr. Putin would have told him that he was about to um, decapitate um, uh, Ukraine very easily and deal with this problem which had allegedly been created by NATO. So I guess that given the way it's turned out, Xi Jinping must feel that he was taken for a sucker by somebody who, who he's described as his best international friend, somebody to use a Chinese expression, with whom he feels as close as teeth and lips. Well, some teeth. So he's got Ukraine, with China seen, see, is seen by many as an accomplice to Russia. Ukraine, which was one of the main recipients of Belt and Road's initiative investment, which I guess has now been smashed to smithereens by Russian artillery. Ukraine and the COVID, the consequence of his policy on COVID, which is plainly a crazy policy, but as I said, dictators live in echo chambers and nobody ever tells them when they've got things wrong. So what happens? I don't think that uh, Xi Jinping is going to disavow Mr. Putin um, I think that would be too embarrassing. It would suggest that his, his grasp of strategic policy wasn't all that um, close. It would also mean that the Chinese uh, would have to recognize that somehow maybe America had won this one. And they certainly don't want to do that. They would like America to continue to be distracted by Ukraine, uh, but they don't want America to seem to be coming out on top. So I think it's a very difficult tightrope for uh, the Chinese uh, government to take, the Chinese Communist Party, 
and uh, it will be fascinating to see how uh, Xi Jinping manages to get from one side of the tape, from one side of the tightrope to the other. So, I used to work for, um, the best boss I ever had was Lord Carrington, who was Foreign Secretary, and after I'd explained the policies of some uh, demented aspect of what the government was doing, uh, he would say rather languidly, and so. <laughs> the and so question is always a difficult one. My and so answer this time is both simple and difficult. Liberal doc democracies have to stick together. Liberal democracies have to stand up for what they believe in. Liberal democracies have to behave like liberal democracies, which the Republican Party in the United States might find rather difficult to accept and understand. Liberal democracies have to stand up for one another when individual countries are being bullied. I think in the years ahead, we have to contain Russia. I think we have to constrain China. Prepared to have a good relationship with China when it sticks to the, what it said it would do and when it sticks to the rules <coughs> and making sure that there is a price to pay when it doesn't. And in the middle of that, is poor Hong Kong, on which I hope we'll continue to be generous with visas, on which I hope we'll continue to speak out. I was asked the other day um, by a Chinese newspaper, what is the one word I thought I could use about Hong Kong? And I said, unique. I think it's the only open society with liberal values which wasn't able to elect its own government. And I think it's unique in the sense that it's the only free society which has seen its freedoms under the rule of law trashed by an income coming sovereign power. Ai Weiwei, the great um, artist and sculptor says that um, the important thing to remember about Hong Kong is that it's on the right side of history. That it's pretty well the only Chinese community you can think of where people have never had to fear the sound of a knock on the door in the middle of the night. I think that's true. But I think what Hong Kong has represented bravely in the last few months and years are values which we are going to have to show we can stand up for, whether in Ukraine or elsewhere in the years ahead. Because if we don't, our children and grandchildren won't enjoy the same sort of period of relative peace and prosperity that I've been lucky enough uh, to enjoy, and many of you the same. So, I hope that's not too depressing. <laughs> um, but it's all in our own, it's our own hands. One last, there's a Spanish poet called uh, Machado. And his, one of his poems is about a, an old Spanish proverb. Somebody says to him, uh, where's the road? And replies, traveller, there's no road. Roads are made by walking. Thanks very much.